Good afternoon. Happy Sunday afternoon. I just poke my head out the door and there's these big old flakes of snow falling just gently in the air. <clears throat> Reminding me again, it's winter, but very gently falling. Very nice, very relaxing. Glad you could uh, join in uh, this afternoon. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 4. We're going to get there in just a moment. Um, as promised, I said that I would give you updates on national days coming up. Not every one of them, but ones that pique my interest. And uh, so for all you Winnie the Pooh lovers watching, tomorrow is Winnie the Pooh Day. I don't know what you do, but have fun. All right, and then Tuesday, you might want to make Tuesday a uh, movie night. Because Tuesday is National Popcorn Day. Mm, that sounds scrumptious. And then Thursday, this day actually could get you a ticket. Okay, because this Thursday, oh, I shouldn't say you get you a ticket. I don't know if that's true, but it is National Hugging Day. Oh, could you imagine everyone hugging each other right now? Woo! Anyways, uh, and then the best, I saved the best for last, okay? Saturday. Mm. Saturday is the greatest because it is National Pie Day. I mean, I think I'm going to partake. I'm actually already thinking about... A strawberry, not strawberry, a cherry pie. Oh, what a big dollop of ice cream on that. Oh, anyway, we're here to talk about Revelation, not about food. I have to remind myself all the time. All right, Revelation chapter number four. <clears throat> uh, Revelation chapter number four, and we already looked at verse one, but I'll read verses one to four. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven, and the first vo voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and sardin stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns <clears throat> of gold. All right, let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer as we get going. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day given to us, and Lord, I pray you encourage our hearts as we continue uh, looking into Revelation, and Lord, the important truths that are there for us, and help them to be encouragement and challenge to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week... We looked at verse 1, a really important transitional verse. And now, uh, in the rest of chapter 4 and chapter 5, it's a really deep look, you could say, into the throne room of God, what's, what's taking place. And really, the scene, as I've studied it, I mean, I've studied it before, too, and you probably have. Uh, you know, it's hard to get your mind all around what's happening in this scene. I mean, it's really beyond, beyond our comprehension, like what, exactly everything that's happening. And John gives us just a glimpse. It's a small glimpse. And, you know, this is a really good um, principle for us today in the day we live in. A small glimpse of heaven really does help us. It gives us a perspective. Uh, take them, uh, the events around us, the trials, the problems that happen all around us. All by themselves, they make no sense. I mean, a lot of people who are lost without Christ say, that this doesn't make sense. Why is this happening and things? Uh, but, you know, we have that heavenly perspective. We understand that God's in control. It really helps us have a good earthly perspective that God is working things out. And he has an understanding and he has a perfect <clears throat> eternal plan that he's bringing it all in together. Now, a few years ago, me and my wife uh, went to Holland. Actually, I think it's two years in March or April we went. At any rate... Um, and we had an opportunity to go to uh, Corey Team Boom's house in Harlem, uh, in the Netherlands. And at the end of the tour, 
there is a gift shop. I mean, it's just like everywhere else in the world. And you do your tour and there's a gift shop. And there's all kinds of neat stuff, like a, no doubt about that. Really interesting things. But my wife picked up a bunch of cards. And uh, I'm going to show you the card in just a moment. <clears throat> but uh, she, in the card, it was written by Cora Tim Boone. She wrote this little poem. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I do not choose the colors he works so steadily. Of times he weaves in sorrow and I in foolish pride. Forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and explain the reason why. The dark threads are as a needful in the weaver's skillful hand as threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. So on one part of that, I just want to get a, too much of a glare from the light. You can see it looked pretty nasty, right? That's the underside of it. That's the front of the card. And then the inside, look how nice that looks. Now, just a good perspective that God's working things out. We don't understand all the, the knots and the nasties. He's got it all worked out. He's got a perfect plan in place. I thought that was pretty interesting this week as I was going through it. So today, that having that heavenly perspective helps us today in the situations we're in. So I read verses 2 and 3. So we see that John was immediately in the throne room. I was set in heaven, once sat on the throne. <clears throat> the first thing John sees is God himself. And that must have been a pretty amazing event, pretty thrilling. Uh, to go to Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen of England, I would be honored to go do that. That would be super cool. I would love to do that. But to walk into the very throne room of God and see him sitting on his throne, that, again, is beyond description. And that was an honor for John, but every believer, if you're watching this video and you know Christ as Savior, you're going to see God on the throne. It's going to happen. You'll enjoy that one day. He is ruling. He's the ruling one. The first thing John sees is a throne set in heaven. A throne speaks of sovereignty, authority. We are viewing the one who occupies the space of absolute authority over every affair of heaven and earth. There's numerous scriptures for that. Psalms 47, 8, God reigneth over the heathen. God sitteth upon the throne of his holiness. And Psalms 103 verse 19 says, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Uh, so, you know, he, we see that throne room. And the word set, that's an interesting word, set uh, there in heaven. It speaks of stability, firmness, and durability. So that is giving to us the reality that God's throne is eternal okay it's set no foe will ever be able to force him down there will be no coup d'etat there won't be any uh rigged elections nothing of that nature you know no overthrow no revolution no he is on the throne permanently he rules and reigns psalms 45 verse 6 Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Uh, this world uh, may not recognize God's authority and rule today. They really don't. But he's, it's still, he still reigns. It doesn't matter. The whole world, the whole, what, seven plus billion, eight billion, whatever it is now. I didn't check before I started uh, today. Uh, how many it is. If everybody turned back against God, God still exists. And God's power does not is not dependent upon man. God is God. And men don't give a second thought, a lot of, of the existence of God. But God notices all. He controls all. And ultimately, he will judge all. And men go through life. Actually, I think they do think of eternity more than they would like to let on. But they try to go day by day without thinking about God. And I'm sure there's days they're successful with that. But one day they will face him. And one day... Every knee, every man is going to bow. Uh, so then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. We'll tell, we'll, we'll stand before God and give account. God is real and uh, we need to be serving him. Uh, John attempts the impossible. He tries to attempt to uh, describe God. 
Uh, he uses jasper and sardon stone. The word like is, okay, this is where we're, uh, we see have an encounter with uh, symbolic language, okay? God is not a mineral, so he's not like jasper and a sardon stone because he's like a mineral or a stone. The idea is the appearance comes to John's mind, his appearance. Jasper is clear and bright. If I turn a light off that's in front of me right now, I would not look as bright <laughs> on, the, on the screen. I would, it'd be a lot of darkness in this room, okay? The idea is clear and bright. That's who God is. It's, uh, it has this, it's kind of like a diamond as well. Diamond's very hard uh, and firmness. Hey, that's our God. He's, he's firm. He's unchanging. Uh, and since we're in the context of the throne room of God, well, his laws are firm. They're unchanging. What God says goes. Um, there are certain laws in nature. Well, actually, since I certain, all laws in nature are not, are not are, aren't changing. Okay, the tides come every day since the day of creation, since God instituted the tides. Take gravity for example. So about uh, I guess it was just it was after New Year's. Uh, so I guess about a week and a half ago, maybe a little bit more. Uh, I took. Matthew, Nathaniel, and Hannah to a tobogganing hill, sledding hill here in Brampton at Old Quarry. And uh, it's safe and everything is good. The city's made it into a nice tobogganing hill, whatever. And uh, somebody had built a ramp uh, earlier when we had a bunch of snow there at Christmas time. I guess it was Christmas Eve storm. And uh, it, was, it was a really good ramp, like, Whoever built it knew what they were doing. And Matthew, all of them took off on it, but Matthew did the best. Like, I got a picture of it. He looks like, uh, uh, I guess it was Calvin, Calvin Hobbes comics. He looks like Calvin taken off on the um, on that ramp. I mean, it was perfect. I got a picture of it. Looks like he was going to be shooting off in outer space. Well, he's he's home, okay? He's, still, he's not up in space, drifting around. He's gravity brought them right down right after I took the picture. Okay, God established it. It's firm and it's unchanging. Sometimes we wish it wasn't as firm or as unchanging, but it still is. And the same true concerning God's moral law. He's unchanging. He's inflexible there. Men constantly kick against it. Um, you know, they call the Bible outdated, old-fashioned. Listen, they can think whatever they want. God's not changing. This is what he said. He has the best plan in mind. His plan is perfect. And, uh, you know, they can kick against it as much as they want. It's still going to be God's law. Uh, the Sardin Stone is blood red stone. It reminds us that while God is God of a sovereign rule and absolute authority, he does have, he holds men to a high standard. Uh, he's the God of redemption as well. He is the God who saved all those who will turn to him by faith. He provided the plan of salvation. Uh, thank God he's a saving Lord and as well as a sovereign. Um, and but he he demands he wants to see holiness and righteousness. Um, he has mercy, but he will judge um, all those who will not come to him. But he desires all would. Uh, before we leave the stones, just a couple of little side notes about uh, the stones. Uh, Sardis and Jasper were the first and last stones of um, the high priest. You can find that in Exodus chapter twenty-eight. Um, Verse 1721, the Sardis was represented the tribe of Reuben and Jasper represented the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, these two stones represented all the 12 stones of Israel, which every stone represented a tribe. And they were a reminder that God kept his people and his covenants and his people close to his heart. That, that was the idea behind it. Uh, and these stones are a constant reminder that God will keep his word and do everything he promised to do. Uh, so that's that's encouragement to me. It should be encouragement to you. And we see God's throne is encompassed by an emerald rainbow. Um, the rainbow is not like that we see here on earth, I don't think. I think it's much different. Uh, it's, it's, a ra it's the whole room, the whole throne room is affected by it. There's a, rain, a rainbow round about the throne in light like unto an emerald. Uh, so it's different. We know that um, the rainbow is uh, singles the fact that the storm has ended. 
that's when we see beautiful rainbows, right? After a big rainstorm has gone through. And there's the rainbows, right? Sun's, sun's shining. I think the prettiest rainbows I've ever seen in my life have been in northern New Brunswick. Uh, and driving up and down there back when I was a kid, coming up to visit family up in Ontario. Go through there after a big thunderstorm, and we would see numerous double bows. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, again, it, it's a symbol to us that God will never destroy the world again with a worldwide flood. Uh, this rainbow in heaven is a reminder that when we arrive, storms are done. There is no more. Uh, God's going to judge the earth, but in heaven we're safe, we're secure. He's holding his word. He's true. Uh, and the rainbow speaks of God's mercy too. Even as the wrath of God is about to fall on the doomed world, uh, God's still moving with some mercy and restraint. Uh, you know, people are still going to come to know Christ during the tribulation time. Habakkuk 3, 2, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. And he does. Absolutely remembers mercy. Every person in this world is headed to an encounter with God. Everybody. Everybody will face him. No one escapes that reality. You know, uh, people try to escape responsibility, uh, taking care of bills, you know, different things. And some are successful in getting away from those earthly things. But no one escapes the face-to-face -face encounter with God. We all will have it. Um, I would suggest to you to make sure it's in scenes of glory rather than the halls of judgment. All right, that would be my suggestion and recommendation, encouragement, challenge, whatever word you want to use to make sure you know Christ the Savior. That is the most important thing. And, and it's a wonderful thing for us as believers. One day our burdens are going to be lifted. Tears are dried. You know, uh, our hearts, broken hearts healed. And uh, we'll be home forever. I'm looking forward to that. Looking forward to being home forever. And it's it's coming, Okay. And we're a day closer now uh, than we were yesterday. Okay, we're, we're traveling the road and we're getting there closer each and every day. All right, and then verse number four, we see some, just not the throne now, we see some people around it. Uh, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. So crowns of gold. Uh, so who are these individuals? So, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I've heard lots of different um, suggestions. Some people preach it like gospel. Uh, they're angels or whatever. Some think that uh, elder, you know, that's what it is. Now, I have not, in my time studying the Word of God, and I'm not saying I know everything about the Word of God because that's not true, but I've never seen the word elder used in reference to angels in the Bible. I haven't seen it. I don't believe it's angels. Others think it's different groups, whatever. I think they represent all the redeemed children of God. And I'm going to give you some evidence for that. Uh, they're sitting on seats. <clears throat> it's the same word translated throne in verse number two. Uh, and thus they seem to be reigning with God. And saints of God will rule and reign with God someday. 2 Timothy 2, uh, 2, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, we, he will also deny us. Revelation 1, 6, Revelation 2, 26, 27, all again, verses that support that ruling uh, with him, reigning with him. Um, it, it seems to be a bit of a representation of people. Uh, Revelation 21, verses 12 to 14, the new Jerusalem comes down. That's a wonderful study. Look forward to getting there in the days ahead. And we see there's 12 gates, named after 12 tribes of Israel. And then there are 12 foundations, which contain the names of 12 apostles. And I think, I mean, okay, so you do your math, 12 and 12 is 24, okay? I think it's representation of all those who've been redeemed through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Everyone who's a trusted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Okay, the people in the Old Testament had to have faith in God, just like we have to have faith in God today. So we all are saved the same way by putting our faith in God and Jesus Christ. Uh, I believe that this is a representation of all you know, the saints 
uh, throughout the ages. In the Old Testament, just a bit of a reference point, David appointed 24 Levites to represent the entire priesthood. Uh, that's found in 1 Chronicles 23 and 28. When a meeting was necessary of the entire priesthood, and it would have been impossible to gather every one of the thousands of the Levites together, but when 24 came together, they represented the whole body. Uh, so I, I believe there's a correlation here uh, that these are eld the, with these elders, they represent the entirety of the redeemed saints of God. The elders represent believers. They re represent us. Um, so what are they doing? That's who they are. What are they doing? They're sitting. There's, they're, there's rest. Their labors are over. They're sitting. They're at rest in the presence of God in heaven. You know, we are seated with Jesus Christ in heaven today, according to Ephesians 2, 6. And he have raised us together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is our positional situation. Practically, here I am, right? I'm laboring. I'm, I'm uh, longing, living, longing for heaven, living in this world, okay? But one day, practically, I'm going to be right there too. Uh, and... That's an encouragement to us with all the burdens, cares, worries, concerns, fears. Hey, that'll be all behind us. We might be facing some of those things today, but when we go into the new, into our home in heaven, none of those things are going to hinder us. They're not going to, they're not going to bother us. They're not our baggage to heaven. Okay, we'll enter into His rest. That sounds fantastic, right? Um, then they're clothed in white raiment. <clears throat> white raiment in the Bible speaks of righteousness of the saints in Revelation 19, verse 8. God forgave us, or saved us. You know, we forg He forgave our sins, cleansed us from every stain forever, declared us to be uh, forgiven, justified in His eyes, 1 Chronic uh, Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified, in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That's our positional standing. Now, practically, we mess up. We sin, we do wrong, but we should be striving to live in a way that will bring honor and glory, righteously, holy. That's words that definitely you see in the Bible. Uh, we need to live in a way that magnifies the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day we'll... This, we won't be in these bodies anymore, and we're made in his image, and we'll be perfectly holy and righteous, just like he is. And there's a day coming when that's going to happen. Um, it could be tonight. I would be very happy with the rapture taking place. I would be, Lord, so come. Uh, at the same time, I need to be laboring for him, waiting for his um, uh, appearing. Uh, and when we leave this earth, you know, uh, sin's not going to follow us. So uh, these, the appetites for sin, desires and things for it are gone forever. We won't have to, we won't be affected by that. We see some of the things that there. So it's, not only do they have on white raiment, but they have on crowns too. Uh, and had on their heads crowns of gold. So we're going to spend a little bit of time here. Uh, and then we'll be finished up. Uh, they had on... These crowns, and the word crown, there's two words in the New Testament for crowns. One word is diadem. This is a word that is described many crowns that Jesus will wear when he returns in power and glory and reign on earth in Revelation chapter 19, verse 12. That's a, very, that's a kingly crown. That's the crown of glory. The other is the stephophos, which is, refers to a victor's crown. It speaks of the crown given to individuals who are victorious in athletic competitions in that time period. And so Jesus wears a diadem, and we wear the victor's crown, Stenophis, uh, and that's earned by the saints. And we're told of at least five, and I've heard other people say there's more, and there could be lots more, I don't know, but we know there's a reference to five, and uh, I'm going to mention them, they're not mentioned here in this, but I'll mention them in the verses for it. So crown of life, James 1.12, blesses a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So this crown is given to those who demonstrate their love for Jesus uh, by successfully enduring trials, temptations. They stay with the Lord, the crown of life, that 
victor's crown will be given to them. A crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all those that love his appearing. This crown is given to those who live in the light of his coming. Okay, The saints who long for, who live for, they just can't wait for Jesus to come will receive this crown. Um, you know, the idea that we need to keep, I don't think it's actually that hard for us right now because we see what's going on around the world. And we're like, oh my goodness, this is, woo, this is bad. And the Lord's soon returning. Uh, but the idea that we're longing for it, we live for it, uh, we labor for the, for the Lord as we're waiting. So that's the crown of righteousness. Uh, the crown of glory. On the chief shepherd shall appear, he shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. This crown is a reward of the faithful pastor. Uh, so that's the third crown. Uh, the fourth crown is in 1 Thessalonians 2.19. For this is our hope, our joy, our crown of rejoicing, are not even yet ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. Uh, this crown is a reward for those who faithfully share the gospel, point others to Christ, have that heart for the gospel and you know they're continuously spreading uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. And then the last one is the imperishable crown. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.25, <clears throat> And every man that striveth for the mastery is uh, tempered in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. So the word of this crown is a word to those who battle the flesh and seek to live holy lives. Um, in, in, a work, in a wicked world. Uh, you need not worry that your service for Jesus Christ will go unnoticed by him. I've met numerous individuals who have, in various states of mind, some, I mean, they may were having a bad day, and they told me in no uncertain terms how they labored and they didn't appreciate not being acknowledged. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I felt bad for them. I wish that someone had noticed. But I'm going to tell you right now, i got some really encouraging news. Everything you do for the glory of Jesus Christ, every sacrifice, every effort, he takes note. Nothing missed. Okay. You're not going to stand before the Lord and say, Oh, do you remember this time when I was 16 and I did... No. Everything you've done for Christ will be marked down. There's nothing going to be missed. He takes note of every prayer, every witness, how your testimony is, every secret thing you do to bring honor and glory to his name. He knows it. And he will reward those who faithfully serve him. You may not receive recognition here, but surely you will over there. And in fact, if, I mentioned already just a few moments ago about those who are upset they didn't get acknowledged, but if, they, if you do it just for acknowledgement of men, that's your reward. There it is right there. And that's found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. Too. Listen, we should serve. Who cares if anybody sees? Uh, it's not about uh, Joe or Sister Sue seeing. It's all about serving Jesus because we love him. All right, so there's a lot of good material there for you just in those few verses, okay? Um, so we'll continue. We'll finish up chapter number 4 uh, next time. But be encouraged, okay? Be encouraged with the reality that one day you'll be in that throne room. But John's trying to describe, we'll get there and say, John, I mean, how did you, why did you even try? <laughs> I know the Lord made you do it or led you to write that. But we'll see it in all its glory, in all its beauty, in the details he could not transmit in writing. We will see it and we will experience it, not for a day, you know, if I went inside the Queen of England, I'd do it for maybe, you know, if they let you, half an hour maybe, you know, uh, eternity with Christ, with God, uh, with God the Father, all right? Uh, be encouraged this afternoon as you serve the Lord. Uh, you know, keep that memory, keep that in mind. Eternity's coming, eternity's coming. Let's be serving and uh, redeem the time for his honor and for his glory. All right, so Wednesday night Bible study, 7 p.m., um, and again, we apologize for the little uh, change of schedule with everything that was coming down this week uh, with the stay-at-home orders and things. So uh, we got some songs recorded, which you enjoyed this morning. 
and then uh, Wednesday podcast, and then Saturday, Devotion 8.30, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you have a great Sunday night. I hope you have a great week at work, at home, I guess. A lot of us are working at home. And let's keep each other in prayer, redeem the time, and keep looking to Jesus. Take care and God bless.